Jenny Woodward. <laughs> we always look forward to her outfits when the weather's on. <laughs> Look, uh, my uh, topic is just on uh, Will's Gone Wrong. Um, and I think certainly in this last 12 months you've really seen a number of articles in the paper, haven't you, in terms of wills that have gone wrong. Um, Justice Burns, the Supreme Court of Queensland, currently sitting, is contesting his own mother's will. <laughs> yeah, so someone who normally wants to keep their life very private is out there signing affidavits about the relationships with his brothers, his mother, and all that type of thing in the most public um, you know, forum there possibly is. All that is um, obviously accessible by anyone. So that's coming down to that sort of detail. And we're seeing it each sort of Sunday, particularly, aren't we, in the sort of the Courier Mail, there's another article about, you know, greedy son, you know, doesn't have to repay parents. Or, you know, the New South Wales decision last week by adult children or adult sons saying you, you don't have any entitlement to your parents' estate. So it's quite a sort of a controversial sort of subject. And we go back to the 70s when they're, you know, I can remember my parents, one of their siblings passed away, and at the funeral, mum and dad were going around collecting money to pay for the funeral. Today, that rarely happens, does it? You know, typically people have got superannuation, there's insurance in superannuation if someone dies early, the value of houses is that much more. So you're always talking about substantial estates, aren't you? And of course, we've also got the blended families, you know, where we've got that sort of that natural ground, isn't it? So today, you know, we see fights between children, don't we? And that's sort of more vigorous than the fights between, you know, ex-spouses. And then you see the fights between second spouses and children from the first marriage. Fights between children and charities. You know, it wasn't that long ago that charities, if they were in a contested will, they wouldn't even appear in the proceedings. They would just accept whatever the result is. Yeah, we'll just accept it, we won't appear. Today, probably because of lawyers sitting on their boards, they say, why should we do that? It's hard enough to fight for that dollar, isn't it, that charity dollar. So they're in there, and if there's been an allocation made to them under the will, they're going to fight for it. So. You know, the, the landscape's changing all the time and I think it always comes down to the mighty dollar, doesn't it? You know, people always say, I'm doing this on principle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fighting my mother's estate on principle because, but really it comes down to those dollars and it comes down to often things that happened 30 and 40 years ago. You know, that unresolved dispute that communication that didn't happen, that lack of trust or that type of thing. So um, it's always about the dollar. I find at the end of the day where somebody dies with nothing, there's usually not much of a fight. <laughs> um, a new term that we learned just last week when someone came to visit us, quite a wealthy family, they checked on each other and they thought that they were quite healthy. Three children, all married, and one of their in-laws came along to them and said, oh, look, we're not sure if we want to keep on living in Australia. Could you give us our inheritance now? And he popped into the office the very next day <laughs> and he told me about inheritance impatience. But um, it's almost this sort of thing, isn't it? Look, always do the right thing by your kids. Can you just hurry up and die? <laughs> <laughs> and that's how they felt, isn't it? You know, hang on, we made this money. We want to spend it, we were sort of enjoying our lives and they've got pressure on them to pass it on to their kids straight away. So, you know, what is that sort of time frame for, you know, succeeding control? <laughs> <laughs> there seems to be a successor, popular or not, isn't it? But when is he going to take control? Should he have been given the gig by now? Is he too old? What's the best age for that succession? And the one I was going to talk about was one of the most sort of successful ones I've seen in terms of um, this was a business started by a grandfather back in 1924. In the furniture industry in Australia, you'll see that we go on, it has 750 employees, five different locations in Australia, eight cousins are currently the owners all who receive a discretionary dividend of $3 million a year, each. 
So fairly good sort of succession from that business that started in 1924 by Grandad. Grandad had seven kids, four boys, three girls. Unfortunately, in that time, the girls were receiving other assets from the estate, but not they weren't even considered for the business. The oldest son, he thought he should get control much earlier, and he left and set up in opposition to the business and eventually went broke. The next one down was never interested in the business. He was a doctor and he just set up on his own and he's still alive today. The other two brothers, the younger two, their father said, look, you're working here in the business. You two are gonna take control of this business. And they got a lot of grooming from their grandfather. They often talked about his values and business ethics and that type of thing. One of those brothers, after having his four children, died at 51 of a heart attack. So quite a young age. His brother said, don't worry mate, you know, on his deathbed, I'll look after your children. They'll always be part of this business. That fellow must have been quite a bit of a, a forward thinker because he looked at his nephews and he identified one of them at 13 years of age as the person who was going to take over the business. He installed him into the job when he was 25 years of age. That fellow today, 59, still running the business. What's his difficulty though? The next generation, isn't it? Next generation down, there's 23 kids, if you like. But he remembers that he was putting control of the business when he was 25 years of age. And obviously, you know, groomed by his uncle into that position. What about the dad, though, that overlooked his own kids to be the CEO? <laughs> he obviously recognised there were going to be some jealousies, weren't there? That's just natural, isn't it? Hey, Dad, <laughs> what about me? Why aren't I good enough? And his children also were offered roles in the business. Everyone could have a role according to their ability. So each person was entitled to a job, but if you were qualified for sweeping, that's what you did. And most of these kids started as um, sweeping up or doing those holiday type jobs, you know, picking up the scraps and all that type of thing. Um, so quite a good sort of a system. With the 23 though, the CEO sort of recognised, look, we just can't pick one out of the 23, can we? How are we going to know who's going to be the best? So what he's tried to do is, he said, this business is going to be too fragmented, isn't it? I need to go to a situation, if somebody wants out, they can go out. And with liquidity issues and the type and obviously the value that's involved, he's gone to that public company model. He convinced the family board to sack themselves and to put in an independent board. So originally, you know, he started off with the advisory board, the family was still making all the decisions. Then he said, hang on, let's install a couple of these people on our board. And then he got all the family members to actually sack themselves and you've got an independent board. They're moving to float part of the company off. So if anyone wants to go to the marketplace and sell off their shares, they can. Prior to doing that though, again, remembering at 25 years of age, he became the CEO. He and the family met. And with those 23 children, even though some of them don't have children, they allocated 20% of the company to those 23 now. So before they've died, They've said, here you go. And they've allocated 20% of the company because they said, based upon they've got a, a dividend policy in place of you know, 20%, they retain 80%, but they take 20% of the profit each year, um, that those kids will earn or will receive $100,000 fully franked a year. So they don't have to work, do they? <laughs> if they want to have a, a lifestyle where um, they're not out there working, um, they're quite entitled to do that. And of course, obviously, when they inherit what their parents have, they're going to have a fairly um, luxurious sort of lifestyle. But they've given that to them now so they can start managing the money. With the business too, the business is changing. And what happens with, is anyone in a business that has cycles? <laughs> I know we are. <laughs> um, but in those cycles, 
where they've made a lot of money and they're retaining 80%, they've put a lot of that into investment income, into passive income streams, to the point now where the passive income stream from the business is now less than the the passive, sorry, the passive income stream that's generated by their investments is more than the actual production of the business. So quite a good place to be. Um, and I think you'd have to say it's a success story, wouldn't you? Out of those eight cousins, one was selected to be CEO, anyone could have a job. And a few people sort of got to the general manager type level, but they've all retired now and they've just left their one sibling or cousin in charge. He gets paid a commercial salary for what he does, and he also gets bonuses, plus his discretionary $3 million dividend. So he's on a pretty good sort of a wicket. That jealousy, though, um, that obviously happens where you know people have been overlooked, the family all recognise, and everyone says quite genuinely, he's been brilliant in that role, and none of us could have done it. <laughs> they recognise it. And they say, look, he should get those extra rewards for what he does. He's been the success, you know, he's taken it from what it was to where it is now over that, that period. Um, so I think everyone sort of accepts that that's a great model and that that's something that's worked and it's something where in this next generation, if people want to get out of it altogether, they possibly can. But why would you when most of the income's coming from passive income streams, you know, just out of that straight investments? Let's talk about one that's um, handover didn't happen early enough. 89 year old. Mum passed away a few years ago and he decided to remarry. Remarried someone 10 years younger than him. But what's the natural concern for the three sons that were working in the business? They didn't know what his will had. They assumed that you know, they were going to receive X, Y and Z of his assets. The three boys had sort of met and sort of said, look, I should get that, you should get this, I should get that. And they divided it up amongst themselves. But there'd been no open and frank discussion about it. And these 50 slash 60 year old men were still at the beck and call of their dad <laughs> in the sense of they didn't know what was in his will, he didn't discuss it, he kept it a secret and you know, had those special instructions. This will is not to be seen by anyone. <laughs> it was a whim though, because his grandchildren, he worked very hard. His father died in, uh, when he was 19 years of age. And he had a tough old life. And he worked hard. He went to one of the farms though, and he saw that his um, grandchildren had built a, a camp drafting facility. I don't know what a camp drafting facility is. <laughs> I understand it's horses and things. He thought that that was not part of the business and that was something that they'd done personally. He was so upset by it though, that triggered him to change his will and quite substantially. The brother that had had the admin and the sort of the control of the businesses, um, his, there was a sort of a, a paradigm, the power shift away from him towards the other brothers. But all it created was that sort of mistrust. But who was the worst mistrust between, do you think? What about the three brothers? The three brothers, they could all get on with each other. But what about their kids? Did they grow up in the same house? This business had been very successful because they sort of decentralised. They were in three different parts of Queensland. So if it didn't rain in one part, typically it would rain the other, so you could move that breeding herd from the dry locations to the wet locations. So they didn't grow up in the same house. These cousins, when you meet them, most of them can barely talk to each other, <laughs> particularly since the camp drafting incident. <laughs> so again, these guys in their 30s and 40s married and having their own children, what's their future? They're asking their dad, what's, what's my future, dad? What's going to happen here? And their dad can't answer them because he doesn't know what his future is, does he? So again, what I'm suggesting here is that the hand over here, not knowing at eight when dad's 89, going back to that example of where someone was put in charge at age 25, uh, which one works better? I mean, a lot of us like to stay in control right to the very end, don't we? 
are we making great decisions? And I think it you know, creates a lot of uncertainty. There's no communication, there's no trust, and that's where you have all these disputes, those relationship breakdowns. There's financial damage because everyone's not pulling in the same direction like they used to. And obviously there's that huge relationship damage. And I think there was a, a failure both in the second and the third generation um, for this particular business. Again, this fellow has been dying of cancer for three odd years. He's now onto his weekly chemo. Hasn't really discussed the will with the kids and he's doing his will now. Gets chemo on Tuesdays. So can you go and see him on Wednesday to talk about his will? <laughs> so there's only a possibility of seeing him on a Monday, isn't there? Is that a great time to be doing your estate planning? He asks questions like, do you think I should involve my children? His son's the CEO of the business. His son's had a relationship breakdown. His wife was very friendly with his mum and his sister. His sister's not talking to him. So again, you know, amongst all of that, all those changing relationships, this is not a great time to be doing Dad's will, is it? You know, literally months to go, no plan forward, who's going to receive the business, who's going to receive those passive um, assets, and again, a substantial estate. Given that Mum's sort of not happy about his choice and partner, if Dad dies, it's possible for the son to challenge the will, isn't it? He's certainly in the class of people that could do that. Now, that'd be unusual, wouldn't it? Yeah, we're all used to that scenario where if Dad passes away, they leave everything to Mum. And when Dad and Mum have passed away, we leave it to the kids. Well, there's nothing to stop him from sort of saying, well, hang on, I've been working in this business. I don't think I've been paid as much as the other people in this business. It was always in the expectation that I was going to be in control of this business and receive this business. My sister was always going to receive the passive assets. Yeah, what was the understanding? There wasn't any of that discussion. So, again, I just think it's a, a rotten time. And imagine the relationship damage if Dad dies in the next few months. He's not talking to his sister, so there's no relationship to save there. And Mum, he thinks Mum's supporting his ex rather than him. So, again, it's going to be very difficult, isn't it? <laughs> Especially if the will's not what he thinks it's going to be. So... Dad's sort of saying, should I involve the kids? And I'm thinking, yes, you should, you're alive. <laughs> you should definitely be having that discussion. You should be telling the reasons why rather than in your absence um, that not occurring. Historically, people used to do their wills, like that elderly gentleman I was telling you about before, and sort of hide them. Does anyone sort of remember your parents doing a will and it was a secret thing in a brown envelope? And it was hidden in the, you know, in the filing cabinet, in the locked filing cabinet. I don't know why that developed, why wills were a secret. But certainly today, I think the modern sort of thinking, the modern th thoughts are, you should have that out and you should be discussing it with the family, shouldn't you? And if we're just talking about the nuclear family, <laughs> maybe it's a minority nowadays, our mum and dad should be having that discussions with the kids at the table, just talking about it, shouldn't they? And if you look at the successful transformation of that business, you know, you should be putting the kids into important positions. There's another business over at Stafford, and they used to re repair video cameras. You know, the old ones with the tapes in them? Anyway, the son, he went to uni, down at, oh, he went to QIT. <laughs> He's back in my generation. When he finished, he got a great job from Camalco to be one of their cadet managers and earn good money. Dad said, no, 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 mate. No, come and work in the family business, repairing these things and running this business. And one day it'll all be yours. He said, Dad, you know, that's right, is it? This is gonna be mine, not my sister's, not my brother's. It's gonna be my business, so I'll come and work for you. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He worked there for the next 15 years. Obviously got into doing all the warranty work for those big electrical repairers. The business went from sort of turning over you know, a few hundred thousand dollars to multi-millions. Dad came to him one day and he could tell that Dad was going to talk to him about, I'm going to retire, son. This is all going to be yours. 
He's going, yes, yes, it's finally happened, fantastic. Now let's talk about what you're going to pay me for the business. It went into liquidation 12 months later. A little bit of a misunderstanding. <laughs> but they're the sort of things that we see all the time. Um, so I think today's thinking is you've really got to discuss it with the family, you've got to have a bit of a plan, you've got to have be picking out children and just managing how it's going to happen and if one child's been overlooked for another you've got to think about a plan and communication and why um, that's occurring. Things that make you cringe. Tedder Avenue. This man has been inherited or left this beautiful property on the beach at Tedder Avenue. It's still one of those last old cottages out on the front deck. He's got four kids. This fellow's married his daughter. They're both out the front on the deck, Friday afternoon, perfect day on the Gold Coast. Anyway, he turns to his father and Lord, he says, you know, would you mind leaving us this place, you know, as part of my wife's inheritance? <laughs> That was my 9am appointment on Monday morning, wasn't it? <laughs> he was coming in to make sure that his daughter had an independent trustee for her part of the estate <laughs> to try and guard it from that fellow. He said he never felt more insulted in his life and this was what he thought. Stuff you, can you die? <laughs> and, you know, that the person had no regard to his other three children. That's how he felt. And again, it's just happened again last week where a lady's called us, we had to go out and see her, she's an elderly lady, and only two kids, her husband had died some years ago, and the daughter had always got in early for booking the holiday unit down the coast. So, grandma owned it, and the daughter got in there before the school holidays, and she'd book it for her kids and family. She split with her husband, a miserable sort of 18 months, but she's found a new fellow. He's been on the scene for three months. A grandma suspicious of new partners for their children? Yes. <laughs> anyway, they're at this holiday unit, grandma's there, she thinks this is fantastic. My daughter's happy again, she's got a partner, the kids are here, my grandchildren are here, everything's fantastic. My son's here with his wife, with his wife. everything's going great. And then this potential new son-in-law of three months, she hears him organising a dinner party. Oh, I wonder where they're going. Oh, they're coming to my unit. Oh, I'm sure he's going to pop over and be polite and say, would you mind me having a few people over? Oh, oh, they don't want me here. So again, you know, she felt terribly put out. Hey, it's my unit, not yours, not my daughter's. And much the same thing, she's changed the will and she's left the unit to her son. So they're the sort of things that, you know, have ramifications that people just don't think about. Um, that one, again, that prompted the parents to come in. Um, and the double bunger with that is, oh, look, we bought our son a home. We let them buy it in their names. We gave them the $800,000 to buy it. We let them buy it in their name. They signed a loan document. I said, make sure you do a mortgage. <laughs> oh, we don't need a mortgage. They're our kids. They're our daughter-in-law. Steve, could you just check the title? <laughs> and sure enough, they'd mortgaged it themselves for, you know, to a bank to get some extra dollars. And sort of mum and dad were thinking, hang on, isn't this fantastic? You've got an unencumbered home. What are you talking about mortgage payments? <laughs> so again, they're the sort of concerns that people have. Um, and just what should we be doing? My suggestion is to make it go right, that to start succession planning early as you possibly can. Pick out roles for people, train up your heirs. <clears throat> Catherine's going to talk about that later on. She worked for an organisation called Training Heirs. I think it's a great concept and something that there's not enough done about it. Include the whole family in the process and it goes past wills obviously. Wills are just part of the process. You know, you really have to think it all through, control um, and have a plan. Family provision claims, can anyone understand them? 
I was just talking to Rod before, he just sort of said, how is it possible that your will's just ignored? <laughs> They're the sort of things that you're seeing in the paper, aren't they? You know, how did that develop? And again, you know, it came out of that, a New Zealand case. New Zealand was the, the front runner on this, where a fellow died, he had a wife and a young family, and he left everything to his mistress. That big sort of public policy argument came around. Who should look after the family? Should the estate look after the family? Surely he had some duties and responsibilities to his wife and young family? Or does the state have to look after that family? And that was the introduction of legislation to say, if you'd been left out of a will and there wasn't an adequate provision left for you, you could challenge the will. But the category of people that can challenge are pretty limited. And Queensland, we're just talking about spouses and your children and anyone who's dependent upon you. So that's, you know, minors who are dependent. They're the only people who can challenge. So housekeepers can't challenge unless they're, you know, being promised something in those dying days under that sort of legislation. One of the ones, though, that's been rejected recently is, and you can see the sort of large age gap, and it involves some people down the Gold Coast. But this seller was 74, and he um, became romantically linked to the 24-year-old carer of his disabled granddaughter. Marriage went for 18 months before he died. He knew he was going to die and he sat down and he planned things out and he said to her, look, what are you going to need? And he made arrangements for her to receive $200,000. His superannuation, a couple of cars and some cash. She was absolutely over the moon about that. He died and she challenges the will. Challenged it outside of time. The person who was receiving everything under the will was the disabled grandchild. So this came up before the judge. You're all the judge, I've just empowered you. <laughs> How did you think the judge took this? A relationship of 18 months where she received $200,000 versus a disabled minor. So he dismissed it pretty quickly said $200,000 is a lot for 18 months. The estate was just a bit over a million dollars. Um, the only sad thing was that he didn't award costs against her. The estate had to pay the costs of that claim. Okay. Um, so my point I suppose is while people can challenge the will, whether you be successful is you know, quite a different story. Um, a couple of UK decisions that are sort of, you know, international uh, world now, where we see these decisions. Um, two adult sons just challenged because they thought the second spouse was getting too much. They thought they should get more. <coughs> there wasn't much of an estate left because they were so old, they'd spent it. It's a sort of small house that she was going to receive and be able to live in. The judge just said, you two boys are well off. <coughs> you don't need anything. I'm going to dismiss the claim and I'm going to award costs against you. Trustee companies are also, um, you know, someone you can choose to be the executor of the estates. They're independent, but they're typically slow and they like to take a percentage of the estate. So I think if you can pick an individual who knows something about your family, it's far better off. But the money saved by having an independent executor in terms of those disputes is going to easily pay for those independent executives, whether they be accountants or lawyers or whoever, making a charge. You know, the estate will be administered and things will be able to move forward. Sponging Sun, this was the headline in the Sunday Mail only, uh, I think, three weeks ago. His business was going broke and he borrowed about $400,000 from Mum and Dad. Mum and Dad were doing the right thing and they thought they were lending him the money. It was never documented. The company went broke. When mum and dad needed the money, what did he do? Oh, no, no, you lent it to the company. You put the money in my company's account and it's gone broke. I don't have to pay you back. So, you know, typically I'm saying, you know, with these loans, document them. There's three really good reasons to document the loans. You might need the money. <laughs> What's the expectation now? I know when we look at the actuary tables, it sort of says, I'm going to live to be 87, isn't it? But every year you live older, you know, you, I might be ticking up there to 90 now, might I? <laughs> There's a real expectation that people are going to live way through their 80s, aren't they? 
90s, maybe everyone's going to get to 100. You might need that money. If you do a loan agreement and it's a bust up in your child's relationship, that money's got to come back first, just like a bank, hasn't it? So you're not going to lose half of it to your in-law. If it's a gift, oh, I'll help them out, I'll give them a deposit for a house. They bust up five years down the track. Where's that money gone? Down, 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 down. It's gone, isn't it? You can't claim it back. And obviously, you know, if you have a fallout with a child, you want to have a loan agreement in place where you can get that money back, don't you? He's smiling about ripping mum and, mum and dad off. <laughs> That'd be the true successful measure of a parent, wouldn't it? <laughs> Power of attorney disputes, again, these things are happening all the time. Be careful. Poor old dad got a fever. He was 80 years of age. He was the carer of mum. So he looked after mum every day. They built a house in 1954. They were still living in it. He's got a scratch or something in the garden because he's still mowing the grass at 80. He gets a fever. So he's at the hospital. He's got a high temperature. So he appears to be insane. A doctor signs something to that effect for the daughter who thoughtfully puts him into a dementia ward immediately. Puts mum in too because mum needs caring. Then she, of course, what would be the next immediate need for a daughter looking after her parents? She needs a new Mercedes, doesn't she? <laughs> so she pops down to the bank and she makes a withdrawal to pay for her new Mercedes. And then she was obviously a bit light on so she decided to pay her kids school fees out of that money. Um, None of them were in the interest of mum and dad. Thankfully, the psychiatrist at the home recognised that granddad didn't have dementia. And after he got better from his fever, he was released. And he was able to travel to his home that he lived in, that he built in 1954, to see the big full sale sign and the auction on the Saturday. So thankfully, we were able to stop the auction. And we had to apply to QCAT to have that power of attorney cancelled. Do we get the money back for the Mercedes? That'd be a negative. <laughs> the school fees and everything else. But we were able to stop the rot anyway. But they're the types of situations that you know we're sort of facing. So be careful when you're appointing <coughs> someone as your attorney and putting them in control. Um, it would have been nice if um, perhaps they'd appointed their son as well, who was an ice addict, um, <laughs> <laughs> to assist with the decisions. Um, the daughter was thinking ahead and she was taking out $5,000 in cash to give to him to help him buy his ice, so he wouldn't object to any of this. Okay, and again, this, this has sort of happened recently on the question of capacity. We've got a fellow at the moment, he's in his 90s, and he owns a shopping centre worth $90 million. He knows what a will is, he lives by himself, he knows what's in his estate, down to the last sort of dollar and cents. He knows his bank account numbers. But he's 91. He's a bit vague. A psychiatrist has said he hasn't got the capacity to make a will. This lady here, she had 11 children. So obviously back in the era where there were no TVs. There were two groups of the kids, six and five. The older bunch and the younger bunch. I think there were two sets of twins and one set of triplets. But two quite distinct groups. Mum would give one a power of attorney to the, the lady that had always looked after her. When it became apparent that mum was sick, mum had chemo, not that long to go, um, the other group came in and kidnapped her. <laughs> they wouldn't let the others visit. And mum was very much for living at home. Dad had passed a few years away before and she really wanted to go home, even though the hospital staff had said, look, you need a lot of palliative care, it's going to be much easier if it's here at the hospital. So the attorney just took that advice and was, said that. The other camp said, no, no, you can come home, we'll get care for you at home. And they did that type of thing. Question came up about whether there was a new power of attorney signed to the new group. So which one prevailed over the other? We thought, how could someone who's undergoing chemotherapy and sort of been hijacked how could they have capacity to make a new power of attorney in all these circumstances? Appeared at QCAT, the lady knew her name, that was good, but she didn't know what was in her will, who her attorneys were and all that sort of thing, but the member found that she had capacity to make the power of attorney on the day. So capacity is something that's not easy to measure or easy to get tested. 
Um, so obviously do things um, when there's no doubt about your capacity um, to have your wishes followed. Um, just in quick summary, all these disputes come from not having a plan or trying to implement a plan that's way too late. Um, have an open discussion with the family. Get everyone involved who's involved to be part of the plan because otherwise you're going to have that breakdown and that trust in communication. And Catherine's going to talk about later on about how you facilitate those sorts of plans and those meetings. I reckon the best time to do this is when you as a parent are in good health and you're telling your kids what's going to happen, not your kids telling you what's going to happen. Don't leave it until you're sick. Don't leave it until the last minute. Obviously do it in an environment of a lot of, you know, where you're fostering that trust and communication and you know, we're all trying to get the best result for everyone. And obviously anticipate the jealousies and things <laughs> and obviously plan around that and just how we're going to explain that away. All right. Any questions on my stuff? No? Jim? Can I actually um, question you appoint an executor? Can, can that be questioned? Typically not. Jim's just asking, can you can someone question who the executor is? And I I think have been appointed by the court three times to be an executor where the executors have been fighting. So two sisters, two years apart, grew up in the same house, couldn't agree on anything. So the estate came to a stalemate one of the creditors applied to the court to have the executors replaced. So only in those circumstances. In another circumstance there was a diver he was diving up in the Gulf and Carpentaria. He went down three times, he only came up twice. He was declared dead after a period of time. He busted up with his wife about a year before but they'd reconciled and got back together. But he changed his will. He left everything to his son and he made his father the executor of the estate. His father sold up various assets and then went and bought 1,500 cattle and he operated them on his farm. <laughs> and when they went to the abattoir, he kept the money. <laughs> Again, in that sort of circumstances where he wasn't accounting to his son, to his grandson for that money, the executor was replaced. But whoever you pick as an executor won't be replaced unless they're in some sort of conflict or they won't do their job. Uh, do you remember that um, poor lady, I think it was Cap or uh, Cash or something, where the husband donged her on the head and threw her in the boot of the car and left her there for a week? They found her, she was still alive. Under her will they replaced him as being her executor <laughs> and beneficiary. <laughs> so in circumstances like that, you know, those sort of extremes obviously. But you know, if an executor wants to challenge the will, they've got to resign. You can't be propounding the will and challenging it at the same time. Just common sense stuff.